Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our COVID-19 town hall um, hosted by Trusted CI. Um, this is a virtual town hall. The purpose of this is to share a little bit of information that Trusted CI has been uh, collecting and distributing, but also to um, take questions and, and just speak openly about how uh, all of these different open science organizations are dealing with the pandemic. Um, uh, just a couple of things to talk about before we get started. Please mute your microphone if you're not presently speaking because we've got a number of people on this call and also it is being recorded. And I will introduce Anurag Shankar. Uh, Anurag, thanks for uh, running this uh, town hall for us. Okay, thank you, Jeanette. Um, all right, let's go to the next slide. <clears throat> Welcome everyone um, to the virtual town hall, town hall. My name is Anurag Shankar. I work at the Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research at Indiana University. And I'm also a member of the Trusted CI team. Um, I'm assuming that everyone is familiar with Trusted CI and if not, then please visit trustedci.org. I don't think anyone, any of us could imagine the situation we are in even a month ago. Um, I think what we have is a in the middle of a worldwide shared experience, an undesirable one um, of the same magnitude as uh, perhaps 9-11 or the moon landing. <laughs> of course, cybersecurity was not a big concern in either of those uh, situations, but uh, not this time. Uh, we have data everywhere. And particularly now it's flowing to our home offices where, uh, where we don't exactly have documented physical, technical and administrative controls in place. And so uh, it makes some sense to see how people are doing and uh, thus this town hall. Um, lastly, let me apologize for possible, possible feline intervention. My efforts to uh, train my cat have unfortunately not panned out. So uh, before we actually get into the, the, the collective sharing mode, let me, um, let me just mentioned that uh, Trusted CI is offering priority help currently for projects uh, that are tackling COVID-19. Um, so Trusted CI, the NSF CIA Center for Excellence Pilot, and the Science Gateways Communities Institute are offering priority help. Um, you, can, uh, uh, you can email us at covid19 at trustedci.org. And the areas where we can provide um, help are listed here, data management, invis, workflow management, cloud resources, HPC, science gateway, cybersecurity, and compliance. Next slide. We also have some online resources. Um, we have these, uh, we have a few blog posts, which we will go over in, in a minute. Um, there's also the trusted CI uh, discuss mailing list in case uh, we uh, can't, you know, we may not be able to cover everything here. So if, if there's interest, then we can, we can move on to the, the discussion list. Um, also, uh, we put a link here for the NSF coronavirus page. And uh, uh, I think, uh, Jeanette, have you put the link to the uh, presentation somewhere? Yes, I put it in the chat. Okay, so in the chat window, there's a link to this presentation, which has links to these other resources. Next slide, please. So I, I will invite the uh, author of this particular blog post, Mark Krenz, also of Trusted CI, to, uh, to go over this. <clears throat> Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Mark Krenz. I also work at the Indiana University Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research and am a member of Trusted CI. Um, when we first set out to do this, we were just brainstorming um, immediate needs that we think that the, the research community uh, would be facing in light of a large number of students going home, working remotely, uh, graduate students, and so on. Um, and I, we kind of brainstormed this a bit and thought, from the point of view of a research project that is now going to be completely working remotely, not just having one or two people work, work remotely, what are the types of things that would come up that you need to 
try to deal with immediately before going on leave uh, or starting your work remotely. So one of those is just, you know, making sure you have your passwords that you need. Uh, there might be passwords that you've posted on sticky notes to monitors or to servers or something like that. Um, it gave us a good chance to also talk about using a password manager. Um, how are your backups being handled? You know, those might be things where you require somebody to change a tape. So making sure that uh, you continue to have a good backup process in place. Um, university and uh, science environments often have uh, physical space that's much more open than in the private sector. And so uh, in light of that, you you wouldn't necessarily have as many people going by and checking to make sure that things are okay. Uh, so you'd want to make sure that you have control over your environment's physical space being secured, monitored, who you would talk to about uh, reviewing, maybe camera footage or access uh, logs of some kind. Uh, so we were encouraging people to reach out to their local facilities management uh, and security folks to see how they could go about doing that. Um, unpatched workstations that are left on an, an office environment can become an issue, especially given that we might be gone for uh, two to six weeks out of the office. Um, these systems may normally be set up to be patched uh, manually while somebody is on site, uh, maybe clicking through a bunch of links. Uh, our recommendation was just to turn these off if there was no need to have them on for some kind of service uh, or just to account for them uh, being a liability over the coming weeks. Uh, do you have enough redundancy of staff as we face a pandemic that may affect a large number of people? And you know, when we wrote this, it was the sixth, so we were largely unsure how big this was going to become. Uh, so we planned for the worst and thought you should probably tag somebody as an additional backup staff member to handle uh, various situations that normally security staff would deal with just to have some extra redundancy. Um, and also, as you move to offsite locations, uh, your normal forms of communication, such as uh, communicating to people in person, uh, need to all move to online methods. And you want to make sure that you've reviewed how you're communicating uh, during an incident, that you have a secure way of communicating with people. Um, so one issue that uh, came up is that um, if you're going to be using something like Zoom and you're accustomed to using Zoom as, as for instance we are right now, uh, as those systems start to become utilized heavily by classrooms, by even my son's Taekwondo is going to be happening over Zoom now and you know a large swath of the public is going to start using Zoom, there's a great potential for those systems to become overloaded. So I we encourage to we encourage people to look into other backup solutions or another way of communicating should the need arise uh, so that you're not scrambling to find something and choosing something without giving it a good uh, review. Um, are you going to be able to perform all the steps of an incident response remotely? You know, do, does it require some kind of on-site activity that you need to go through? Uh, what about if you need to restore information from backups? Are you going to be able to do that remotely and how? Um, are you going to have enough VPN licenses? This might be something more for your institution to look into. Uh, but for instance, as the universities start to have a lot of online classes, there may be a whole lot of additional uh, load on the VPN server. You may run out of VPN licenses. Um, do you have a bastion host for uh, offering remote access? In other words, like a gateway host that you can log into and uh, then access machines that are behind a firewall or have some kind of controlled access to. Is your workspace secure at home? Um, you know, if we've all probably heard stories already of kids climbing over parents and stuff like that, but as those kids start to go to school and maybe have online activities, it could be that you're doing a video conference at the same time as they are doing a video conference or maybe your uh, spouse is on a you know, video conference at the same time. Stuff that's being said in there and coming out over your speakers could be uh, traffic light protocol red information that you don't want to be sharing with other um, other people, uh, other groups without uh, them going through the proper channels. And then be aware of new phishing tactics and scams. Uh, I'm going to put a link into a page at 
Stanford University uh, into the chat where they have actually shared uh, recent examples of phishing emails that they've received. And there's already been several that have been related to the COVID-19 uh, scam, uh, including like a copy of the John Hopkins stats map uh, that were thinly veiled with some malware, you know, laced with some malware onto it uh, that would infect your computer. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Mark. Next slide. Um, so Mark talked about safeguards that become relevant at home. Uh, that the, when you're dealing with regulated data, the situation becomes uh, even, um, uh, needs to be even more secure. For example, if you have uh, protected health information, if you are doing telehealth uh, things of that nature, then you have to make sure that people can't uh, 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 people can't uh, hear what you're saying. Um, certainly, uh, I'm not going to go over all of these things because it's a long list. That's uh, that's the blog post actually. Uh, the link there will point to. But issues that you might um, have is is collecting, processing PHI, for, for example, for COVID-19 studies you might be having. Um, uh, one of the things that I have in there is for organizations that are not exactly clear about collecting data, um, whether or not this data is subject to HIPAA, that's something you, you might want to check out. Not all identifiable health data is subject to HIPAA. Um, protecting PHI when working from home, essentially the controls that Mark talked about, but uh, some of them are, have been, are stressed a little more, and there's a few additional ones there. A breach notification, if, if you should discover a breach, unauthorized disclosure of protected health information, then, then uh, you have to follow your you know, local protocol for breach notification incident response. Um, we go over also the GDPR, the European Privacy Regulation. Uh, this kind of data falls under something called special category of personal data, and you have to have a consent from the subject before you can uh, use it for legitimate purposes. Next slide, please. Uh, before we move on, we've got one quick question here. How are you advising departments when they bring up OCR and HHS um, are not pursuing penalties during this time? I obviously discourage that, but it has been brought up often. Right, so, so for those who uh, are not aware of this, uh, uh, Telehealth is subject to all kinds of regulations, not just HIPAA, but other ones as well. Um, you have to make sure that you're protecting the, the technical aspects of it, the transmission is encrypted and so forth, but also the physical space. Um, during COVID-19, I think it was a couple of days ago, or maybe, maybe a few, uh, last week, I think the uh, Office of Civil Rights and Department of Health and Human Services, which is responsible for enforcing HIPAA, has come up, um, has, has advised that they're not going to be pursuing penalties for uh, legitimate use of teleconferencing uh, and, and telehealth uh, so that people are allowed to even, uh, the doctors are allowed, for example, to talk to uh, folks on their cell phones and, and things of that nature. Um, so this, this is great, I think, in the health set setting, healthcare setting, uh, because these are critical decisions are being made and information needs to travel. But I think outside of that, um, I think we, we are telling people to still uh, follow the, the HIPAA guidelines, um, especially if they have nothing to do with COVID-19. So that's a very valid point that Catherine has raised. The, okay, next slide, you already have it. Um, we also have a few uh, pointers on how to protect uh, control and classified information. Uh, DFARS is the Defense Federal Acquisition Regulation, um, which means that if you have a contract with the DOD, then you have uh, and have control and classified information, you have to protect it, and the, the controls are a little more restrictive. So we talk about that a little bit. Um, and let's go to the next slide. And as Mark said, uh, there are scams going around, uh, also fake news. And so uh, we didn't put the links here, they're in the blog post. Uh, please, please go and, and check them out and be aware of that. 
Um, Jeanette, I think this one is yours. Yes, um, I sent out a message to the discuss list. Um, there's a phenomena that's been called Zoom bombing, which is when you host a public meeting and someone takes the screen share uh, uh, controls and starts sharing things that, that you don't want being shared in a public meeting. And um, so the way to prevent this from happening is to log into your Zoom account, go to the settings tab, it's on the left side of the screen. You can do a control F search for screen sharing and you'll pull up uh, this section here. I have a screenshot here in the slide. Um, under who can share, you'll change the default of all participants, change that to host only. And so for example, um, Anurag is a co-host of this meeting that I set up so he can share his screen if he wanted to, but none of you who are guests can share your screen. Right, uh, another control that they uh, recommended is that you can, you can also um, essentially start using a, a meeting waiting room, in which case uh, people can still get in, but at least you know who is trying to get in and you can explicitly allow each uh, participant to get in or use uh, a, a pin or password for the meetings, uh, again, depending on the sensitivity of the meeting. So that's that's what we wanted to cover um, uh, at this point. I think we're, we're going to open up, I'll open it. We'll have sort of seeded it with some questions. Uh, so, when uh, a couple of instructions, uh, please keep yourself muted, um, except when speaking, and please introduce yourself before you uh, speak. So let's go to the first question. So, if you've moved your staff to working remotely, what challenges have you encountered? And th those of you who are watching, you are free to unmute and uh, comment if you would like to respond to this. Hello, this is John Haverlack. I'm with the U.S. Academic Research Fleet. Uh, I'm here at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. And I would just say that it, it really hasn't been that problematic because most of the resources that we need, most people already have access to. Um, so we've had, the only challenges we've had is getting people connected to VPN, if they're not familiar with that, um, and providing university resources for people who use map shared drives, because uh, we don't want them doing that from their home computers that we, that we don't know about. Um, so we're worried about things like uh, uh, ransomware viruses encrypting shared drives. Um, thus far, we haven't seen that happen. That's, that's about it, but it's not been a huge impact. Uh, we've had a few, a few issues supporting people getting connected, but nothing, nothing too egregious. This is a question for Jeanette and anybody else who owns the Zoom rooms. Have y'all been getting mails at really odd times saying, please start your meeting as your participant? Okay so-and-so and it's a name you recognize as waiting and I don't think those I think that's some kind of a weird phishing or an artifact or something weird I think that happens when someone might be checking a link and starting a meeting before a meeting has actually begun and so then it's notifying me the organizer hey someone's in this room I oh, think I, that's I, what's happening well I mean that's what it looks like but when I when I say weird times I mean like at uh, 11 30 at night I mean, there's never, we, we have no meeting scheduled even close to 1130 at night. And my boss sent me one and asked me if I tried to connect at one in the morning. I said, nope. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, I was just wondering if anybody else has, has seen that. Cause yeah, I mean, ten till people start joining and I got those, I've gotten those messages forever. This is Melissa Cregan. Uh, I'm at SDSC. Yeah, I had a couple of those last night. It was 10 hours after the meeting and I just deleted them. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I just delete, I just delete them. I just didn't know if it was like a phishing attempt or if it's just like um, Allison said, it's a delay because Zoom's getting hammered right now. I have definitely, this is Lee Liming at the University of Chicago. I've definitely gotten them after the meeting, um, like many, many, many hours after the meeting. Um, they finally arrive. Um, so it could be that too. 
this is Pat Murphy at NRL. Uh, same thing. I've had a few of those at really odd hours, and again, I'd be just deleting them. I don't think they contain links or anything. This is Kay Avila from Trusted CI. I just want to say, even though it sounds like the consensus is they're probably not malicious, it's great to be suspicious because it does sound like a great potential phishing attack right now. Yes, good point. Thank you. Um, we do have a question here um, in the chat that I would like to get to before we um, move on. Um, one person says, uh, my, print, my home printer's embedded web server is still, up, is still using HTTP versus HTTPS. I presume that's a problem. I'm hoping to upgrade. Thoughts? Question mark? Any um, admins want to tackle that? That's a pretty good printer if it allows you to install a certificate. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I mean, I don't know. I, I would say it really depends on how well you trust your home network. You know, if uh, home networks can be um, infected with malware that's potent or perhaps on the router that's sniffing traffic that's going uh, between um, over the Wi-Fi to your printer. So that could be an issue that you have to be concerned about. Um, if, if it's not a big issue, you might, you might just consider installing a certificate as long as it doesn't break for other people. This is Horst Severini, University of Oklahoma. I think as long as your Wi-Fi, uh, uh, your personal Wi-Fi is encrypted with WPA2. I mean, yes, nothing's perfect, but uh, being on a home network that can't be accessed from the outside world and encrypted Wi-Fi, I think you should be okay. I would suggest just turning off the web interface unless there's some feature you need regularly there. Uh, I would just turn it off. Yeah, the, uh, this is Craig from IU. I, I also think there, there's some popular, you know, home uh, modem router things out there recently that have had really bad uh, vulnerabilities show up. So just making sure that, that uh, you're updating, that that thing is getting updated that you're not usually looking at is a, is a good practice. This is Lee again. Um, I know that my HP printer, for example, um, has uh, the, the ability to update um, HP on how much ink I've used so that they can send me ink periodically. Um, and so I imagine that's probably being done via some kind of HTTP server on the printer and maybe even um, plug and play um, with my router. Um, so I do think that it's probably something to be aware of um, happening on your network if, um, yeah. Um, I see a question about split VPN, uh, split tunneling. It's interesting because uh, I think it was yesterday, uh, IU sent out a message saying that they will begin utilizing split tunneling for most users. At NRL, we, uh, our VPN is uh, configured to use split tunneling, period. Basically, just anything to our home site, anything.nra.edu goes via the tunnel, but Google goes out via the regular internet. Yeah, I know, I know they were having some uh, capacity issues with the VPN. They, they tried to make some attempts uh, to uh, limit the VPN use to uh, certain, certain sorts of things. Um, but I think it's a fairly sort of common thing with the licensing. Um, issues. Shall we move on to the it's next question? A, oh, go ahead, Kay. Can I say something real quick? I just want to say to you, it, especially if your remote workers are using Zoom, it may be a performance concern as well, that then they're sending all of that traffic back to your home institution before it's going out. So you might be choking the bandwidth at your home institution, and also they're not going to have as good a performance as if they went straight out to the internet. 
So one of the things I know NCSA has traditionally provided an option for a full tunnel or a split tunnel and then advice to people based on what they were doing on what they needed to be using. Before we move on, I just wanted to provide an outlet for people. Um, I'm, I'm rather concerned about this. These are all these reports about uh, Zoom notifications. This is something new to me. I haven't heard about these coming in at odd hours unless people are just testing the links. Um, if you see a Zoom notification like that that comes in and it's kind of strange, if you could take a look at the at the link that's provided in the notification and if it happens to go to a different location, like it's a phishing email and it goes to a different location than the actual uh, URL for Zoom, if you could forward that to me uh, at mkrenz at iu.edu, I think we'd like to know about that more so that we can look into that and notify the community that those types of phishing emails are going out. I see another there... question. Sorry, go ahead. No, Jeanette put my email address in the chat for you to use. Thank you. There, there's another question there. It says, are there any specific security holes with phones which are always listening? Yeah, Lee is saying he disables Hey Siri, OK Google on phones, tablets, et cetera, for specifically that reason. Um, I can press the button if I need to ask for something. Lee, I completely agree because I find it so intrusive and I, I mean, yes, I disable it as soon as I get a new phone. <laughs> uh, how do you, how do you do that? Uh, do you have a blog post about how to do that on an Android phone? Uh, I don't have an Android. I apologize. Um, okay. Uh, any, any Android users uh, could help with that maybe. And, and here's another weird one, Pandora. Now I don't necessarily think Pandora I mean, unless they're selling information, but um, I've been driving along in the car, talking to my girlfriend, we're, you know, we're pl playing music and she says something and Pandora says, okay, now playing such and such song. Now, which, the way it's supposed to work is your, it does do voice, but you have to click the mic. It's not supposed to be always listening. <laughs> One bit of advice I have for uh, like the home uh, assistant devices, like the one from Amazon, I won't say its name, so I don't trigger it on everybody's. Uh, but uh, on those types of devices, you can usually set a notification bell so that when it hears the wake word, you at least have some kind of audio reference that it's turned on its microphone. And that's one uh, mitigation that you can use to kind of alert yourself to, hey, there's something listening in the room. And then, of course, they also usually have a hardware microphone uh, mute button, so you can actually click the mute and it's hardware muted. So that's another thing that you, you can look into using. Okay, let's go to the next question if there's no more. Have you seen any load issues with Anisic or with tools or other monitoring as a result of the outbreak? And I guess Zoom doesn't count. <laughs> uh, looks like someone's saying there were a few Google related hiccups yesterday. Yeah, Jose, can you elaborate on that? Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yep. Yep. Yeah, this is Jose from uh, UCAR. And uh, UCAR is a, has purchased a G Suite uh, service for, for mail and, and all the other tools. And uh, it, we just noticed yesterday there was, uh, there was a, a small uh, video conference of three people and all three of us were kicked out of that meeting basically simultaneously. And there are other random things that kind of happened within a three hour window. And then after that, everything seemed to stabilize. Um, not sure if uh, Google's, you know, rebalancing or, or, you know, making software changes, but definitely was, was very noticeable.
I know there's another question that we, I think it's related to this one and I'll, I'll go ahead and ask that now, but um, are you seeing any changes in, in the, the patterns that they have like net, for example, traffic patterns or attack patterns and, and things of that nature? Other than just the phishing emails and I'll, I'll just jump in and say again, yeah, we haven't noticed a major change. I mean, there's definitely an uptick in phishing, um, but through our NSMs and, and some basic log examination, we're not seeing a lot of difference in what we normally see. Yeah. One thing I've noticed recently, um, this is Mark Cran. So um, I don't think it's necessarily related to COVID-19, but for instance, I use a alternate port for my SSH traffic just to cut down on the amount of noise. It shouldn't be the only um, security mitigation that you use, but it's one that can help you just kind of reduce the load. And I've noticed recently that on my host where I, I do this, that they've actually started finding those alternate ports and are starting to run brute force authentication attacks against those ports. So all I can say there is just make sure that, you know, an alternate port isn't your only form of uh, security mitigation. You also need to make sure that you're uh, following all the other security mi uh, mitigations for your services. Um, Anurag, we've got someone, John here saying, um, we have a number of people who have been capped, who have capped data plans and have a challenge working remotely. Uh, we use trip mode to mitigate uh, per application bandwidth usage on Windows and Mac. And he's got the link there. Yeah, there, there, this is something perhaps I should have done, but if, you, if you're on the Educos CIO list, uh, there's a massive discussion going on there about uh, various tools and, and just people sharing a lot of information about what, what's working, what's not working. Um, you know, it was interesting that there, there was talk there of virtual graduation uh, vendors, which I hadn't even, I wasn't aware there was such a thing. <laughs> um, perhaps, uh, perhaps I'll go back and glean the, the most important things and put something together there, but um, have, yeah, the provider has in fact lifted caps. I, I think some of them have, but I'm not sure if all of them have. Let's go to the next question. Okay. Are any institutions designating security staff as essential personnel who must continue to report for work in person? I can jump in and uh, say what NRL has done. We have um, defined a skeleton crew, but we've basically also said that uh, if you don't need to actually come into the building, do not. Uh, and typically there are only like one or two people in any given building of our like four or five across the country. Yeah, I'm trying to think of what would require a security person's physical presence on campus? Yeah, this is Jose from UCAR again, and uh, I'll just mention that uh, our campuses, we're relying on uh, a couple of facility staff and a couple of networking staff to be hands-on, and they've worked closely enough with most of uh, the other IT teams that they're familiar with our Colo facilities and some of the setups. Um, so especially for the security team, we can pretty much trust them um, to be remote hands. Um, and my security team are completely telework at this point. Yeah, I mean, I can see the, the physical security people. I mean, I'm not sure what the situation is with uh, all, the, all the campuses being empty. <laughs> so burglars may be thinking this is a good chance, but uh, so I'm not... I don't think anything has changed, at least here, uh, but uh, I don't know if anyone wants to comment on that. I, this is Craig. Um, I, I, we do work with some places where 
it's very difficult to draw <clears throat> a clear distinction between cybersecurity and physical security. And I think it, it certainly is a good practice. If, if your cybersecurity people happen to be the ones who regularly check the locks on a backup server room or something like that, you know, to, to make sure that you're in court, it, if you're not going to be coming in, uh, make sure you're in coordination with the people who are responsible for, for the physical security around things um, uh, like, like, like key facilities where you've got PLCs or important backups and things like that. <clears throat> and it might be a good time to find out if nobody is on the hook to actually pay attention to those kind of things. Um, Anurag, we got a comment here from Ken. On Linux systems, we use fail to ban to temporarily ban IP addresses that try too many brute force intrusion attempts, SSH login fails, or attempts to retrieve non-existent URLs, et cetera. It's highly configurable. So fail to ban. Yeah, it, it's, it's fairly commonly used uh, across the board. If, you, if you're a Linux security person, you would, you would know about fail to ban, but that's a, that's a, good, it's a good security control. Security tool, I would say. So it, it, so it seems to me that uh, well, there's not a huge trend of designated security staff as essential who must who must uh, report in person. So um, I think I already went over this. So let's keep going. Um, well, <laughs> we just talked about fail to ban, but. Uh, and I, when I say tools, I mean, in general, are there any interesting tools that, that have, that are, let's say, that you have deployed after, you know, during the outbreak? I mean, I guess if people haven't seen big changes, then I'm assuming that they're not deploying any new tools either. But perhaps you can just talk about some general tools that, uh, uh, that have to do with the like, home homework situation. <clears throat> I'm just going to throw a joke out there and say that UCAR wants to be cool like Indiana University and they want to use Zoom. So, <laughs> yeah, it was it was interesting um, as probably all of you are. I'm impressed by Zoom's ability to, to do all this. And the person that manages Zoom here at IU, I, I was speaking with him yesterday. And, uh, and he said the Zoom's buying as much capacity as possible. They also have very efficient codecs and so forth. And in fact, they are trying to keep their uh, current load at 50%, which is amazing. <laughs> so if that's really True. That means that we can kind of rely on Zoom, uh, you know, for, for for this for this whole thing. It's very interesting to see. Uh, has anyone seen any any slowdowns in, in Zoom itself? Oh, those who use Zoom. I know Zoom has uh, reported um, some scaling issues uh, in split servers and some things like that over the past. Uh, past week. Uh, if, you, if you go to status.zoom.us, you can see a breakdown of that. And you also, if for those of them from a security standpoint, they've been updating their firewall filters quite a bit because they've been scaling more and more into AWS. Yeah, that's just in case you didn't know it, that Zoom is entirely based on AWS. And that's why they're able to scale so easily. Uh, going back to the tools, we've got a comment here um, from John. Our university is looking into using VDI for secure remote access to campus resources. Allison, plus one on getting out more VDI. We have people who want to go to campus because they need to RDP to their desktop, which got turned off. Uh, not a good model for availability or security. Yeah, that's right. The VDI solutions are, are popular. Um, we are, I think, uh, working on something that would allow we have we have a citrix environment and uh, to set up some a, 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 i think a cluster of citrix 
machines that will allow people to get into their own machines. I'm not sure exactly how they're doing this, but but yeah, the VDI for those who don't know is virtual desktop interface. So this is this is either a remote desktop into your uh, machine or your remote desktop into a VDI environment from where they might just provide you the tools that you need. Um, that's very popular with, with things like uh, in compliant environments. So like for CUI, um, but but yes, I mean, providing access to to, to work machines is, uh, is probably a very good use case for that. <clears throat> Allison says, I see long delays on Zoom transcription. That's correct. Also, recordings are, are slowed down, I, I understand. <clears throat> okay, let's go on to the next. Um, well, we got this question here. Do oh. you want to take this one in the chat from John? How at risk do we think the general internet is to a broad disruption of services over the next few months? Anyone wants to comment? <clears throat> I mean, I personally think that the, the risk is probably not very high, <clears throat> but this is not based on any real data. So <laughs> perhaps I shouldn't say that. But I mean, the fact that this massive upsurge has more or less worked um, gives me some confidence in our ability to, to do this. Now, this is true here in the US, but it's not necessarily true globally, by the way. <clears throat> there, are, there was a discussion on the CIO list about uh, potential places where you can get free internet access and uh, uh, other types of services in, in like Philippines and some of those uh, Southeast Asian countries. All right, let's go on to the next question, uh, compliance challenges. Anyone dealing with uh, HIPAA or any other types of uh, issues from, from home? This isn't exactly the crowd that I used to deal with compliance too much, but there's, there's always some some people. Uh... This is Tom Barton at the University of Chicago. Uh, indeed, I deal with that kind of stuff as part of my role here is to help enable, uh, you know, research that has uh, compliance or other kind of security or risk management obligations associated with it. And yeah, there have been some further concerns, uh, uh, probably uh, threefold, I would say. We do operate a, a, a secure research computing environment and it uses a VDI and there's been a uh, considerable increase in demand for folks to, to move their projects into the secure data enclave so that because it's set up for remote remote operation. And so that's been a little bit of problem coping with the uh, sudden increase in demand. Uh, a second thing is that uh, there are a number of investigators who gather primary data that is like interview sub research subjects uh, in person. And of course, these days, uh, they're either going to pause that work or they're going to do it remotely through Zoom or something. And so there's been a host of questions about, can I just use Zoom? How can I use Zoom? All that kind of stuff. And so those are, I think we've kind of covered the elements of how you address those questions here already. Um, and then there are those that have, uh, where there are data use agreements, they've got contractual obligations to keep things in an air-gapped room. And basically, there's nothing we can do about that. We can try to put them in touch with the data providers and see if they would care to uh, loosen those, those obligations uh, for the duration. But that's generally a long process. And these days, those kinds of inquiries don't get turned around very quickly because everyone else is dealing with all the fires. Right, I was surprised because there wasn't a whole lot of guidance until this uh, OCR guidance came out about the, the telehealth. Uh, I went to various sites to see if they were you know, allowing any uh, concessions and, and, and I have to say I found nothing. <clears throat> so I guess that means we have to keep things compliant or uh, stop the work if you can't get to the air gap room. <clears throat> 
Now, I'm kind of curious, uh, kind of going back, not, not, not to the compliance uh, angle, but just more, but we talked about some physical lab kind of things a while back. Um, I know that the University of Chicago, all the PIs of, uh, of, of labs had to have uh, last week plans for shutting them down or moving them into a mode, you know, obviously um, quite unlike their normal mode of operation. And I don't know uh, if folks have had any experience um, with that kind of uh, obligation. Not experience, but that's what they're doing here at IU as well. I'm not sure. I mean, I think, that, I think I read something about some remote lab type software, but uh, I'm not sure how many labs can actually use that. Yeah. But I think I think that's something people are looking for, or certain activities that can be made remote or uh, yeah, I'm, I haven't been following it. I'll just note the one obvious <coughs> exception to that uh, imperative here is labs that are doing work to do with coronavirus stuff or that are converting to that. They will be given all the leeway that they need. Okay, well, um, I think this may be the last question. Um, any impact on research? And we've got a reply here in the chat. Um, John saying the US academic research fleet has been paused for 30 days. This is a huge impact on the ARF and the oceanographic, uh, oceanographic research. Yeah, do others have like specific examples? I mean, clearly the, the lab, not being able to go to the lab is, is a big, big deal, but uh, other types of examples have heard from faculty or researchers. also are watching carefully because uh, our major facility is uh, floating an anchor off the coast of Panama and uh, that's fine because we're in a service mode right now anyway so it's not impacting research but we're carefully watching the situation because at some point we probably want to come into port somewhere so um, that's a very fluid situation we're watching. And Patrick is saying the ALMA array has been shut down completely. Other NRAO facilities, VLA, VLBA, and the GBT are still operational. Well, why don't we, um, we've got some time left. Um, I was hoping to end this meeting uh, five till. So uh, with the time that we have left, does anyone have any, any other questions or concerns that they would like to share with the group and, and maybe come up with uh, solutions? So this isn't as much uh, security or compliance related, but I just wanna call out that it's been a little more challenging to get a bead on where our staff are and UCAR is like a pure research facility. Um, so, you know, we have a lot of uh, scientists and whatnot and, you know, getting feedback from them, at least for me, compared to the way it was two weeks ago is, is really difficult. I, I'm, you know, almost panicking, but not quite. It's just more of like trying to figure out how to, to make sure that they're still there and that they're okay, you know. So one of the thing, one of the things that we're doing, I think a lot of people are doing this is we have a half hour, a half hour coffee hour at nine o'clock in the morning. Uh, just people have to check in. I think many people are doing it just, you know, very brief check-ins to, to make sure people can see each other's faces and also basically address these sorts of things. Have you considered that? <clears throat> yeah, I think uh, our HR group are, are standing up, uh, things like that for sure to, to kind of get there. I, I've not yet personally been involved as we're still kind of monitoring our network boundary. Um, but yeah, I mean, the number of tickets that the central IT teams have been receiving have just dropped off completely. It's kind of frightening. It, I don't want to, I don't want to jinx it, but <laughs> I mean, we're not getting the response, you know, the, the questions and the, and whatnot, like we used to. And that's actually a very interesting observation. I don't know if other folks have seen, uh... Uh, what this, uh, the situation of their help desks. I mean, I'm assuming that 
since people's environment is much more limited at this point that, that uh, the number of tickets would go down, but uh, I'm not sure. Uh, anyone else has any observations? I'll just say briefly that uh, we've seen a very large uptick in the use of both Slack and Mattermost. Mattermost is the free equivalent that you get if you install GitLab. Um, it's been very, very popular uh, with all the staff working from home. We also have a new uh, Slack workspace uh, that Another method for people to have an informal uh, kind of back channel, if you will. They're not supposed to use it for anything official, but it's great for, um, as you mentioned, coffee time together or just a check in in the morning and that sort of thing. Thanks for that update. By the way, uh, we've kind of adopted a new protocol to let people know when their microphones aren't functioning well. And I just wanted to let you know, Mr. Gates, that your microphone is kind of cutting in and out. Uh, so this is always a good thing to, to mention to people as they move to home environments, they might not have uh, the same microphone that they normally do. Uh, so we're always telling people, you know, it's like you might want to investigate and test your microphone with uh, a colleague. Don't, be, don't feel bad, Phil. Like we really beat up on Vaughn yesterday for his new little headset thing. Well, I'm not even at home, so I probably just need to talk louder. <laughs> Well, um, while people are uh, thinking of something to ask, I'll just kind of briefly go through uh, some conference updates. Um, uh, the IEEE World Forum on IOT, IoT, Internet of Things, has been postponed till 2021. Uh, the EDUCAUSE Security Professionals Conference has been postponed. They're moving online. The GPN annual meeting in May um, has been postponed as well, moving online. That was a recent announcement. Um, and then PERC, I checked PERC uh, earlier today, and they, are, they say that they're looking into hosting online, but they have not made any official statements yet. So be on the lookout for that. Um, we've got a question here from Gabby. Um, human subjects research. Uh, teams need to verify identity when it comes to participants um, signing informed consents. Uh, this has made it difficult for some teams having to come up with uh, roundabout ways to accomplish this as it slowed down the IRB institutional review board process as this kind of change usually requires a modification to the IRB application. Um, so I guess I, if I'm reading this correctly, I think Gabby is giving us a heads up uh, about this. Yeah, it's interesting because the uh, <clears throat> I haven't been to too many IRB uh, meetings, but <clears throat> They're always in person. You have to kind of sign a waiver almost to get to to go into it. And uh, so I was wondering what what they were doing. It's the question I was asking. <clears throat> so they even they have have had to go offline or um, remote. <clears throat> so we're going to wrap up this meeting in a couple of minutes. So could we get maybe one more question? If you have one, you're free to speak. Also, I think we're going, this is kind of a trial balloon. And so if we feel the need to continue having a meeting um, in a week or so, we might, we might be sending out notifications about that. Uh, feedback is appreciated. Um, so any, anyway, uh, last call for questions. Uh, someone asked if the recording will be posted. Yes. If, <laughs> assuming that we can get it downloaded from Zoom, yes, I will be hopefully posting it uh, shortly and sending it out to the discuss list. And as well as uh, a, a link to the, to the slides as well so you can distribute to your colleagues. Um, yeah, with that, I will start to wrap things up. Thank you all of you um, who participated in this, in this talk. Thank you, Anurag, who helped steer it and Mark who contributed. Um, and uh, with that, we will be in touch. Uh, everyone stay safe and we'll see you soon.